Okay, we want to say a little more about inner product spaces. Um, and another example of an inner product on P2, which is a set of all polynomials, quadratic polynomials, form AX squared plus BX plus C, uh, we can have a variety of inner products. One inner product that we've already looked at is where we take the inner product of P1 with P2, where P1 and P2 are quadratic polynomials, by integrating the product of the polynomials from 0 to 1. Okay, that gives us an inner product, uh, and we investigated that a little bit. Another inner product would be where uh, the inner product of P1 with P2 if P1 is A1, you know, P1 is A1x squared plus B1x plus C1, P2 would be A2 plus B2, A, A2x squared, B2x, C2. Uh, the inner product uh, could then be A1, A2, the product of the coefficients of x squared, plus B1, B2, the product of the coefficients of x, plus C1, C2, the product of the constant terms. And that's completely analogous to the standard, to the dot product, if you represent the polynomial as A, B, C. Okay, the ordered triple A, B, C could represent the polynomial, and the dot product would then be identical um, in algebraic form to the dot product of vectors in R3. Um, if you're dealing, of course, with polynomials, they aren't vectors in R3. They don't have the geometric interpretation as arrows, but they're still considered to be vectors uh, for very good reasons, as you see if you go into more advanced math courses. Okay, so that's another possible inner product. Another is related to this one. If we just multiply this product by some number that we'll call D, this product by some number that we'll call E, this product by some number that we'll call F, and, of course, use the same D, E, and F for all dot products in P2. Then we have another definition of P2. It's easy to prove that these are all dot products. They all satisfy the properties of dot products, positive, definite, etc., etc., commutative. Uh, okay, so uh, that's another possible dot product. So we're going to use this dot product for several examples. <coughs> so we want to find... <coughs> the magnitude of P, where P is just AX squared plus BX plus C. There's only one vector here, so we're not going to bother with subscripts. Just call P of X AX squared plus BX plus C. What's the magnitude of P? Well, you have to know how the magnitude of a vector is defined in an inner product space, and it's just the square root of the inner product of that vector with itself, whatever the inner product. Now, for this particular inner product, the product of P, AX squared plus BX plus C, with itself, well, we have the product of the first coordinates of the two vectors. Well, they're both the same. They're both A. Product of the uh, X coordinates, they're both B. And the product of the constant terms, they're both C when you do the inner product of the vector with itself. So you get D times the product of your x squared coefficients, that would be d times a times a, and then you're going to have e times b times b, and f times c times c. Now you might be wondering why would we do this? Um, I can't actually give you a good answer for this arbitrary inner product right off the top of my head, but it's typical of things that we can do and often need to for one purpose or another. Okay, um, so anyhow that's it. Now, of course, A times A, B times B, C times C, or A squared, B squared, C squared. So this is just the square root of this expression, D A squared plus E B squared plus F C squared. If D, E, and F were all one, this would look a lot like the Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared plus C squared in three dimensions. That's not what it would be because these are polynomials, not arrows in three dimensions. But... Uh, you see the similarity. We could define a so-called unit polynomial, P divided by the magnitude of P. That would be what? 
that would be P, still the same P, AX squared plus BX plus C, divided by its magnitude, which is the square root of DA squared plus EB squared plus FC squared. <coughs> okay? Now, if... What in the world just happened over here? Okay, I see. Um, if P is A1X squared plus B1X plus C1, Q is A2X squared plus B2X plus C2, then the inner product of P and Q can easily, well, it's defined to be this, uh, same inner product we were using. D of PQ is the so-called distance between P and Q, and we understand this by analogy. Okay, so we draw an analogy, and let me put a little curve around this. We remember that the distance between vector V and vector W is the distance between the tips of the vectors if we put the initial points together. This picture, the length of this side of the triangle, and of course the vector V minus W is just a vector that goes from the tip of W to the tip of V, so that the length of this side is the magnitude of this vector V minus W, so distance between V and W is just magnitude of V minus W. <coughs> well, again, we can't draw arrows to represent the polynomials, although we could do an isomorphism, we'll see that later. Uh, but by analogy, the distance between P and Q is going to be the magnitude of P minus Q. If the distance between V and W is magnitude of V minus W, the distance between P and Q is going to be the magnitude of P minus Q, or, or the norm of P minus Q, okay? And that's easy enough. Uh, P minus Q, and I didn't write it out, but it's just a1 minus a2 x squared plus b1 minus b2 x plus c1 minus c2, just this minus this. So the coordinate of x in p minus q is a1 minus, the coordinate of x squared is a1 minus a2, um, and so forth. Actually, there is the vector p minus q with the norm signs around it, or absolute value signs. And the norm of this is, as before, d times a2 minus a1 squared plus e times b minus b, b1 minus b2 squared. Looks like I lost my 2 on the b, probably because I'm going to write the square. Plus f times c1 minus c2 squared. You can read it, and you can see that this is just what you get if this is your vector. Uh, in the same way, you can see that this is what you get if this is your vector. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Now, uh, at this point, the class asked for some numerical examples. And I was happy to provide those. Although, in my very last numerical example, something weird happened. It's not, not weird. When the numbers don't work, it's just plain old. But I, I, I can, you'll see when we get to it. I can't find the error. Okay. So, okay, let's just say that now P and Q are these polynomials. Then the inner product of P1 with P2 is using the same inner product, four times the product of the A components, if you wish, or the A coefficients, two times the product of the B coefficients, three times the product of the C coefficients then the inner product of these vectors will be 4 times 2 times 1, the a x squared coefficients, and 2 times negative 3 times 2, and then uh, 3 times 5 times negative 1. And that comes out to negative 19, if I calculated correctly. Check my numbers. So there's the inner product of P and Q. Now the, inner, uh, the magnitude of P is going to be the inner product of P with itself. And it's very straightforward. You just are going to end up with 4 times 2 times 2, 2 times negative 3 times negative 3, 3 times 5 times 5, 
or 4 times 2 squared plus 2 times 3 squared plus 3 times 5 squared. If you add those up, if I add correctly, it's 84, it's about 9.2. You do the same thing with Q, and the calculation comes out in a very straightforward manner. Um, I wonder if that was my error. Got a square root of 15 there, I had a 17. It's coming up later. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking for the source of the error I made. Okay, now, we could do the angle between two vectors. We can do the angle between two polynomials once we have an inner product. Okay, the angle between two vectors comes from dot product, v dot w equals magnitude of v magnitude of w cosine theta, something you should know intimately at this point. So that theta is the inverse cosine of this divided by this. Inverse cosine of v dot w over magnitude of v times magnitude of w. So by analogy, we're going to say the angle between p and q, well, we can do the magnitude of p, we can do the magnitude of q, just like we did the magnitude of v and w. We can't do a dot product between p and q, but that's not what we want to do anyhow. We have an inner product. So this dot product of v and w is going to be replaced by an inner product of p with q. And we get then theta equals the inverse cosine instead of v dot w, the inner product of p and q. And magnitude of v and magnitude of w, that'll be magnitude of p and magnitude of q. It's going to then be the inverse cosine. Now we've already calculated the inner product. It's negative 19. And we've calculated magnitude of me and p and magnitude of q, square root of 84, square root of 15. So it's the inverse cosine of negative 19 over the product of these two square roots. Now 80 times 15 is, two, is 1,200. 4 times 15 is 60, so that's 1,260. 1225 is a square root, 1225 is a square root of um, thirty-five. Uh, so I said this is thirty-five point one. Um, actually I should probably opt that. It's more like thirty-five point uh, three or something like that. But you can do the numbers yourself. Okay. So inverse cosine of 19, I'll just take the 35.1. I estimated this quotient. This is almost twice as big as 19. So this is going to be a little less than half, and it's going to be negative. So I estimated negative 40.46. Uh, the inverse cosine of negative 0.5 would be negative 60 degrees. And actually, that's wrong. Um, Not sure what I was thinking, uh, uh, but inverse cosine would be about a hundred. Okay, sixty-three from ninety is one hundred seventeen degrees. Okay, um, and that could be right. It could be off by a bit. So double check my numbers there, but that's how it's calculated. Okay. Um, now, okay. Yeah, we, I'm hesitating because we already did a distance, but it wasn't with numbers. Okay, distance between p q is the magnitude of p minus q, as we saw, and p minus q is 2x squared minus x squared is just x squared. Negative 3x minus 2x is negative 5x. 5 minus negative 1 is 6. So it's the magnitude of this, which means it's the inner pro square root of the inner product of this polynomial with itself. And that inner product is 4 times the coefficient of x squared, squared, squared 4 times 1 squared, and then 2 times negative 5 squared, 3 times the 6 squared. And if I did my arithmetic right, that's square root of 162, which is about 12.8. Not a couple question marks there. Check my arithmetic. Method is correct. 99% sure. Okay. Never quite sure. Okay, now, we want to just do an example of an orthogonal projection. Now, let's look at orthogonal projection of vectors and then adapt that 
by analogy to orthogonal projection of one polynomial on the other. Um, orthogonal projection of vectors in Rn, you got a vector v, a vector w, and we've seen this a number of times, I want to keep reinforcing it because it's really important. Um, you project v onto w at a right angle orthogonally, it's the orthogonal projection. And here's your vector. Now how's that calculated? Well, if you dot v with a unit vector in the direction of w, you get the displacement from here to here. If you multiply that displacement by the unit vector in the direction of w, then you've got a vector of this magnitude in the direction of w. So, here we have the calculation. v dotted with a unit vector is the projection of v onto that unit vector. So there's v dotted with a unit vector in the direction of w. That's the projection of v on a unit vector in the direction of w. And here is the unit vector of, well, a unit vector in the direction of w. If we multiply the projection of v onto the unit vector by the unit vector, we get the vector projection. By analogy, we say that the projection of P onto Q, now I used arrows, but these are polynomials, so I shouldn't have arrows on them, okay? Projection onto Q of P is going to be not the dot product of Q with the unit vector in the direction of P, but an inner product of Q, P, I'm sorry, inner product of P with the unit polynomial. It's called unit polynomial Q divided by its magnitude. And then we multiply that. Just like we multiply here by a unit vector in the direction of W, we multiply it by a unit polynomial, if you wish, in the direction of Q, which is just Q over its own magnitude. And then we just do the calculation. Well, the simplification here, I will do P, inner product of P with Q, and divide it by the magnitude of Q, because that's going to be a little neater. Um, and we'll have the advantage then, if we have the magnitude of Q here, we have the magnitude of Q here, so we get the square of the magnitude of Q. So it'll be a nice number instead of a square root of something. Okay, well we do this, let me get this board out of the way. So again, completely by analogy with the way we project a vector in Rn onto another vector, um, and get the vector projection. We get this projection, and I should call this a vector projection, and maybe I should have arrows over these. Maybe I'm being a little inconsistent. Okay. We use the same symbolic picture of the calculation. We just use the calculations with the inner product that we've been using. Now the inner products have all, and, and magnitudes have all been calculated previously. So the inner product of P with Q is negative 19. Magnitude of Q we found is the square root of 15. And then Q itself is x squared plus 2x minus 1. And I think that's the right factor. Okay. Um, let me double check myself. I don't trust myself. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now it's just arithmetic. We just got these numbers. Well, these numbers multiply out to negative 19 over 15. Okay, the denominators multiply out to 15. And actually what I did was I distributed the, distributed the negative 19 uh, through the polynomial. Got this. Very straightforward. Then I just decide, okay, I'm going to do this as negative 19 over 15 x squared minus 38 over 15 x plus 19 over 15. And there's my vector projection. Okay. Now, I want to also talk about Gram-Schmidt, uh, at least the first step of the Gram-Schmidt process. 
just illustrating it with the vectors uh, 2, 3, and negative 4, and negative 1. I want to use these vectors to create an orthogonal set of vectors that span R2. Now, these vectors are linearly independent. We can sketch them here. Uh, we can test for linear independence. We can write a matrix, reduce it, and all that stuff. Uh, but we know that these vectors are linearly independent, most simply because their dot product isn't zero. Um, uh, no, forget what I just said there. They're not orthogonal because their dot product isn't zero. They're linearly independent for all the other reasons. Um, so what we're doing is we're using this basis to get an orthogonal basis for R2. Now, there's no good reason necessarily to do this, um, but if this was 2, 3, 0, and negative 4, negative 1, well, uh, never mind. There, there, there are reasons we want to do this. Usually for a set of vectors spanning a subspace, a set of linearly independent vectors spanning a subspace, a lot of times we want an orthogonal or even an orthonormal basis, which is orthogonal vectors divided by their own magnitude, so they'll have magnitude 1. <coughs> and you're going to see that. It's, it, those are fairly easy ideas, although you might not know why it's such a big deal when you first start dealing with them. Okay, we use this basis then to get an orthogonal basis, and the way we do it is we project one of these vectors onto the other, and then we subtract that projection from the vector that's being projected, and we get a vector that's perpendicular to the other vector. Well, waving hands isn't going to show you that. Here's a picture. Here's the vector V. Here's a vector W. Here's a projection, a little dotted line, white dotted line, at a right angle to the direction of the vector W. And right there is your vector projection of V onto W. If you subtract this vector projection from V, well, you get V minus the vector projection that vector is going to be parallel to a vector from here to here, which is perpendicular to the direction of W. So this vector is perpendicular to W. So all we have to do is calculate it and then verify that this vector and W are, in fact, orthogonal. Okay, well, uh, I've done that calculation, and um, it didn't end up being orthogonal because I made a mistake somewhere. So I'm going to watch really carefully as we go through this and see what I could have possibly done wrong because these are all pretty simple calculations. Okay, so here's our V, here's our W. The projection of V onto W, well, we dot V with the unit vector in the direction of W. That's this dotted with this. Unit vector in the direction of W is the W vector, negative 4, negative 1, divided by its magnitude. Now, its magnitude is square root of 4 squared plus 1 squared. That is the square root of 17. So I don't think I've got a mistake there. And then we multiply that by this vector divided by the square root of 17. That's our unit vector in the direction of W. When we do this, here's our dot product. And that looks like we get negative 8 from the 2 times negative 4. And 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, that gives us negative 9. Okay? Uh, don't see an error in that number. Okay? We multiply that by the unit vector in the direction of W, the negative 4, 1 divided by its magnitude, the W vector, in other words, divided by its magnitude, and we get, what? Negative 9 seventeenths, because we got the square root of 17 twice here in the denominator, times the vector negative 4, negative 1. Well, this is a multiple of this vector. It's, if we take it one step further, 9 times negative 9 times negative 4 is 36. Negative 9 times negative 1 is 9. There's a vector. It's in the direction this way. And that matches the projection of V, the direction of the projection of V onto W. It's a multiple of the W vector, but it's in this direction as it has to be because V has a component in this direction. Okay, so it's in a direction opposite the direction of W. There it is. 
so I see nothing wrong. Now, if we do then V minus that projection, then we get this vector that's supposed to be orthogonal to W. So, let's see, I do that. I do 2, 3, that's the V vector, minus 36 seventeenths, 9 seventeenths, that's a W vector. I do this in my head, but it's pretty obvious that uh, 2 with the denominator 17 is 34 over 17. 34 minus 36 is negative 2. Don't see an error there. 3 times 17, last time I looked, was 51. Check me on that. I'm getting to where I don't believe even simple products that I've known for years. Okay, but I just verified that two or three times in my mind different ways, and it's right. I, I would bet a lot of money on it. So that's 51 seventeenths, and we subtract 9 seventeenths. Now 51 minus 9 is 42, because 51 minus 10 is 41. Um, so we get 42 seventeenths, but that's very clearly not quite perpendicular to W. To be perpendicular to W, these vectors have to be in proportion to the vectors you would get if you reverse coordinates of W and, and um, change one of the signs. And it doesn't happen. Uh, the components of W are in a 4 to 1 ratio. The components of here are in a 21 to 1 ratio, so it's not going to work, and it doesn't if we were to work it out. So I'm still mystified. I've gone through it a number of times. Whatever mistake I'm making, I'm incapable of breaking out of at this point. Um, so I give up. This should have been zero. Calculate it yourself. Don't look at what I did and see what you get. Um, it's like I've transcribed something wrong or whatever. But that would be then, this would be the vector orthogonal to W that you get based on these two vectors. Okay? Um, so one way or another, that should have worked. It didn't, and I still don't see why. So work it out and see what you think.